welcome guys this is episode two of urgent care stories this episode is a, a very concerning case that you don't want to see in your urgent care but it's uh, there's some really good learning lessons that can be had from this so this was a patient I saw probably like six months into my uh, work at an urgent care and it was the first case of this type that I'd ever seen in practice so you'll pretty quickly understand the diagnosis. So the, the patient is a 70 year old female. She has a history of well-controlled high blood pressure and high cholesterol. She comes in because she was working in her garden earlier that day and she started to become really sweaty and was having some chest pain and trouble breathing. So she comes into the urgent care immediately and my receptionist, when she sees this woman, she recognizes really quickly how ill and how severe this woman looks. So this is a woman who is kind of hunched over, holding her chest, looks pale as a ghost. She's sweaty, diaphoretic. She's, she's struggling to breathe. So all of these things tell you, whoa, this is somebody I need to worry about. This is somebody I need to focus on right away. My front desk did a phenomenal job recognizing that this woman was really sick to begin with. And so she rushed through the paperwork, got everything completed as quickly as she could and brought the patient back to us ASAP. So about two minutes after the woman walked into my clinic, we brought her back into a room. <clears throat> my medical assistant recognized this as well. Hey, this woman looks really sick. She does not look good. She says, hey, Jim, you gotta take a look at this woman. So I rush in, take a look. And one of the things that you learn as you practice medicine is just when you to get a first look at somebody, you recognize who's sick and who's not. So the patient screaming about back pain, bent over, and you know, they can't move and they're throwing up, like that's somebody who you want to take seriously versus the person who's sitting there comfortably saying, I have 10 out of 10 back pain. That's somebody who you're really not as concerned about, you know, and so the way that people act when they're really sick will tell you a lot about them and so just respect that if the patient comes in and and they do not look good this woman pale diaphoretic holding her chest with a positive levine sign the, the findings that tell you this is concerning so what do we do we bring her back we both recognize this is somebody serious so I get a quick history while my medical assistant is getting the vitals so she's getting blood pressure pulse ox uh, heart rate temp all that sort of stuff at that time, I'm getting the history, and basically the history goes about 30 minutes prior to arrival. She was working in her yard. She's uh, you know, pulling some weeds or something, and then all of a sudden she gets really sweaty, just doom and gloom, just doesn't feel right, and then she starts to develop some chest pain. So her husband brings her over to the urgent care. The woman tells me, she's like, I've been dehydrated before, and that's how I feel right now. And I'm like, you're having chest pain though, right? And she's like, yes. And she's struggling to t talk and she's <sighs> just struggling to breathe. And you say, okay, it doesn't look like dehydration to me, but let's do the workup and we'll figure it out for you. So once I get a very quick history, I don't need to know a lot about this woman's history. I really need to do some, some, uh, some workup on this woman. Mainly I need to get an EKG. So somebody who comes in with chest pain, uh, who looks acutely ill, the first thing you, you think is acute coronary syndrome. So, so that's uh, STEMI, NSTEMI, and unstable angina. STEMI is ST elevation myocardial infarction. That's a heart attack with ST segment elevations. That's muscle is dying, heart needs to be saved. You go immediately to cath lab with those people. The second one is NSTEMI, non-ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction. So this is damage or ischemia. The heart muscle is in the process of dying, but not completely dead yet. You sometimes see ST segment depressions, signs of strain, or you have normal EKG findings, but positive troponins, which is a very sensitive blood marker for a heart attack. The last one, unstable angina, all that workup is negative, no troponin, nothing like that, but they are getting chest pain either at rest or with exertion that is different from before, still needs to be admitted and uh, stress test and, and evaluated further, seen by cardiology. So this woman, those are the first three things I'm thinking. Obviously, STEMI is my biggest. I need to rule this out. I need to look for that. <clears throat> well, how do you do that? The first thing you do is you get an EKG. So within the first five minutes of the woman being in our clinic, we've recognized how severe she is. We've brought her back to the room immediately. 
while my MA got vitals, I got uh, the history from her. And then while my MA was placing EKG leads to get a, an EKG, I'm establishing IV access so that if she codes, if she crashes, we have intravenous access to give epinephrine, fluids, you know, whatever medication we need to give and that sort of thing. So now we've got IV access, we've got the EKG, we've got vitals. So we know that her heart rate and oxygen levels are all normal, her pulse is normal. So everything looks stable on vitals. She's not in cardiogenic shock. She's not hypotensive, having a low blood pressure. The EKG shows ST segment elevations in V1, V2, V3. Those are your anterior septal leads. So that's the left anterior descending artery that feeds the left ventricle, the front of the heart, which is the majority of the muscle of the heart. And that's where the uh, ventricle pumps out to the rest of the body. That is a, a very concerning area. My dad actually died of a, what we call a widow maker, a left anterior descending myocardial infarction when he was 55. So to me, that is something I take really seriously. And um, once you recognize that, you, you make the call immediately. So at this point, I see the ST segment elevations. I'm gonna pop up the image right here so you guys can see what it looks like. And if you're looking there, you can see the EKG machine says that this is a normal EKG. That tells you how much you should listen to the EKG interpretation. So looking at V1, V2, V3, you can see that that ST segment is elevated, okay? Now, a lot of times people who are fresh out of school, brand new to practice, one of the big concerns that I had and a lot of other providers has as they get started in their career is, am I gonna miss that heart attack? That patient who comes in with chest pain, am I gonna miss it? And that's something that you do need to know what you're looking at. You need to be able to interpret those EKGs effectively and know what you're looking for or have somebody who can teach you as you practice. Um, in this case, it was a pretty obvious, you know, you look at hundreds of EKGs and um, you start to get kind of a pattern of, oh, this is normal, this looks fine. And then once this one came through, it was like, yep, that, that's exactly an SD elevation. That is a STEMI. So at this point, we've made our diagnosis. This is a STEMI. Uh, heart muscle in the left ear interior descending, the left ventricle is dying immediately. So what do we do? Well, my MA calls 911. We do not have a cath lab at our urgent care. Obviously this needs to go to the hospital, go to cath lab immediately. So while she is calling the ambulance, getting the crew over to bring her to the local hospital to get a, a stent put in and a cath lab uh, procedure done, we are starting to give her the initial medications. Now, there used to be a, uh, a protocol, it's called MONA, it's morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. By far, the best thing that you can do for somebody who's having an acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack is give them aspirin immediately. Assuming they don't have an allergy, that's what we did. So we gave her four 81 milligram aspirins, that comes out to three, you know, 24 or whatever told her, chew them up, put them underneath your tongue. We need to get that into your system ASAP. What that aspirin does is it's a platelet inhibitor. So it blocks platelets from binding to one another. This is thinning her blood a little bit. What this allows is to slow down the production or the, um, the creation of that clot. By doing so, we can try to prevent the clot from worsening immediately. By far, that is the best thing you can do for acute coronary syndrome is give them aspirin right away. The other thing that we do is we give nitroglycerin. I gave this woman 0.4 milligrams sublingual nitroglycerin. We go sublingual with both of these, one, because I didn't have intravenous, and two, because if you give it underneath the tongue, the blood flow bypasses the liver and you can get into systemic circulation a little bit faster that way. So that's all what we're trying to do is just get things into her system fast. The reason you would not want to give nitro in a situation like this would be if their blood pressure is significantly low, if they're in cardiogenic shock, they just cannot maintain their pressure. The nitroglycerin vasodilates. It dilates the blood vessels. The goal of this is to try to open up that blood flow as much as possible, get as much oxygen to that heart muscle as possible, trying to just keep that muscle alive until stenting can be done. The other drug we gave was metoprolol. Metoprolol is a beta blocker. We gave 50 milligrams of metoprolol. Again, her blood pressure was stable, her heart rate was not low, so it was safe to give her this medication. 
one indication you would not give metoprolol in would be if they have a posterior myocardial infarction. Not a super common presentation, but there are some EKG findings you need to know to look for. With a posterior myocardial infarction, you do not want to give beta blockers in those patients. So this patient, obviously it's an anterior septal MI, and so we can absolutely give metoprolol. The metoprolol does two things for us. One, it slows down the heart rate. So the coronary arteries are fed during diastole, during the relaxation phase of the heart. So when the heart pumps, the atria opens, or excuse me, the aortic valve opens and the left ventricle pumps blood out into the heart. Well, on relaxation, you have your right and left uh, main coronary arteries that are just above the um, aortic valve. And those get backflowed when the heart muscle is relaxing in between beats. So if you have somebody with a really fast heart rate, there's not a lot of time for that blood to get into the coronary arteries. So by giving a beta blocker, we are reducing how much contraction the heart is giving and we're slowing the heart rate a little bit so there's a little more time during diastole, during that rest of the heart, to get more oxygen to that heart muscle. Last thing that we gave her was oxygen. So we gave her, we put her on two liters nasal cannula oxygen. Again, she had an, a pulse ox of 97%, 98. Her oxygen level was great. But again, we want to saturate those red blood cells with as much oxygen as they can. So any red blood cells that are getting through to that heart muscle can be well oxygenated and give that muscle the oxygen it needs. All of this stuff was done within about 10 minutes. I am so proud of my staff. Thank God I was not busy that day because we were able to get this woman in the clinic, make the diagnosis, give her medication, call the ambulance, establish IV access, all within a rapid, rapid time frame, and that ended up saving this woman's life. <laughs> Ambulance came a few minutes after. We had already given all the medications. And I, I love ambulance crews, but some of them are better than others. And uh, some ambulance crews, the paramedics, they have a chip on their shoulder. Not all, not all, but just some of them, that's something I've noticed. They think that they're the toughest people in the room. They've you know done some extraordinary things, which they have. I, I'm not denying that but I think you know everybody should have some humility and just be humble and you know you never know what you're walking into so we had called and they were aware that this was a STEMI alert the woman is having an MI they just kind of strolled in pretty casually not really thinking anything serious not rushing and I say hey look you know she's having a uh, STEMI uh, anterior septal leads this is a left anterior descending you know she's got ST elevations they're like okay okay all right so they ask her a couple questions for a few minutes um, she's still you know struggling to breathe holding her chest still looking rough they put her on their gurney they get an EKG and then the funniest part of this was so I already knew I had these ST segment elevations but if you look at the EKG that I did they're not huge elevations you know it's just you can see that it's starting it's progressing well by the time they hooked her up to their EKG machine and they did another EKG probably 10 minutes after mine um, you can see their eyes go from and they recognize, oh crap, this woman is definitely having a STEMI and they're like, okay, let's go. And they, they quickly got rolling on things. So it was just a funny experience. I think after that, they started to recognize that if we called an ambulance, we're not messing around. We're, we're sending somebody who needs to be admitted or who's critical. Um, but anyway, they did a great job. They took her to one of the local hospitals. She went to cath lab immediately and um, she had a full recovery. She did great. We called her a couple days later and uh, she was very appreciative. It really meant a lot to my staff and, and to me to, to be able to hear from her, know that she did well, know that she survived that heart attack, uh, something that killed my dad. So it, it really meant a lot to all of us. And so I was really grateful for that. One thing I want to say is I was super proud of my staff. They did a phenomenal job recognizing how severe the woman was, prioritizing this patient, getting things done quickly, uh, taking commands well, and doing everything that we needed to for this woman. So I am super proud of them for doing that. Um, the the lesson learned from this is is basically just, you know, take your patient seriously. If they look rough when they come in, they demand your attention, your full attention right away. You know, you shouldn't get to them in a couple minutes once you've done a couple of other cases. You know, it's, if somebody is acutely ill, you need to take care of them right away. Um, 
that's that's kind of all I wanted to say about this case. Um, very fascinating. I've seen some other MIs since then. Uh, and I'll tell you another story. There was actually a very atypical presentation in one of the other future videos. But uh, that's the case that I got for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, again, if you uh, enjoy this kind of uh, this, uh, this type of content, just uh, smash the like button for me. Uh, write some comments. Uh, I'm sure plenty of you guys have also seen MIs come through your, your department. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear those stories as well. Um, I'll try to put out a, another episode or later this week um, as well, and uh, it'll be a good one as well. It'll be um, uh, a new case that's uh, been in the news a lot. So anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you have a good week, and uh, we'll see you next time.